prevention of surgical site infection is a cornerstone of perioperative care. It involves the coordination of the activities of people, as well as the operation of both policies and processes within a hospital. Some of these people and processes are in direct contact with the patient, while others are not. Whether or not in direct contact, each person and process should be guided by hospital policy in the goal of attaining asepsis, the absence of infectious organisms. Environmental factors such as ventilation control via a laminar downflow panel as well as temperature regulation are important in preventing surgical site infection. For a more detailed elaboration on the engineering and environment policies of hospital, refer to the course Operating Room Design and Layout. Cleaning and sterilization of instruments are also guided by hospital policy. For a more detailed elaboration on this, refer to the course Cleaning, Disinfection and Sterilization of Instruments. Antibiotic resistant organisms are on the rise. It is important to note that hospital policies and processes around isolation precautions also apply in the OR. These policies can be hospital or region specific. In some regions and hospitals, for example, the presence of a multi-drug resistant organism requires that non-fixed furniture, such as anesthesia equipment, be removed or covered. Inside the operating room and other parts of the hospital, most isolation precaution policies require personnel to wear cap, mask, gown, and gloves whenever coming into contact with patients with isolation precautions. Local protocols should be consulted. For the purposes of this film, the patient arriving in the OR has no isolation precautions. On the day of surgery or just prior to arrival in the OR, the patient should have had a bath or shower with soap. This simple measure can play an important role in preventing surgical site infection. Arrival in the OR is via a dedicated doorway under the supervision of trained personnel. Controlling who can and how they can access the OR complex plays an important role in promoting asepsis. Take note of how the door closes automatically behind the OR staff, again regulating traffic. The personnel escorting the patient are wearing appropriate surgical attire, a cap, scrubs and OR footwear. This attire should be worn in the OR complex only. Take note of how the break on the bed is engaged before the patient's transferred. For a more detailed elaboration on this, refer to the course Patient Positioning. One team member is able to remove the bed without assistance and will now head off to scrub. This team member, the anaesthetic nurse, finalises positioning and may also at this point administer a prophylactic antibiotic if indicated. The timing and type of antibiotic are guided by local protocol. Hair removal is guided by local protocol. It is not considered to contribute to surgical site infection prevention. However, if a razor is used, it may contribute to an increased risk of infection. For this reason, electric clippers are used for hair removal. Adhesive tape is used to remove the clipped hair. Hair removal is a controversial topic and is performed as per the surgeon's preference. Meanwhile, in the scrub room, a scrub nurse performs a surgical hand scrub. This process of hand decontamination may vary between hospitals. In this instance, a brush and nail pick, along with soap and water, and an alcohol rub are used to decontaminate the hands. A brief description of this process will now be given. For a more detailed elaboration on this, refer to the course Basic Surgical Skills – Operating Room Introduction. In addition to the previously mentioned surgical attire, a surgical mask is now put on. Guidance on how to knot the ties of the mask vary between hospitals. In this instance, the ties are knotted in crisscross fashion using bows. The bows allow the mask to be removed easily at the end of the procedure. With this done, eye protection is worn. The surgical hand scrub begins with the opening of the peel pack containing the brush and pick. The pick is removed and the brush left behind. An adequate amount of soap is dispensed into the hands and water used to lather. The pick is then used to remove dirt from underneath the nails with a visual inspection made to ensure cleanliness. The brush is then picked up 
more soap dispensed and the nails of both hands are cleaned. The brush is then used to scrub the knuckles. The brush is discarded. The remainder of the soap on the hands is used to perform a hand scrub for a minimum of two minutes. Scrubbing of the wrists should not be forgotten and thereafter the forearms. Water is used to rinse the hands and forearms. Take note of the angle and direction in which the hands and forearms are passed through the water stream. This movement prevents potential contamination of the hands by water dripping down from the forearms. Hands held high, they and the forearms are now dried with paper towel. A separate sheet is used for each side. As with washing, the hands are dried first and then the forearms. An alcohol rub is now used to complete the surgical hand scrub. The palms are rubbed together and then the fingertips are cleaned on the palms as shown. Thereafter, the base of the thumb is cleaned, followed by the other web spaces with the fingers interlocked with each other as shown. Finally, the back of the hand is rubbed against the palm with the forearm and wrists cleaned and allowed to dry. Cleaning with alcohol rub is then repeated, but this time only the hands are cleaned. In zoomed view, take note of the hand movements once more. The cleaning of the web spaces by interlocking of the fingers is of supreme importance. To prevent surgical site infection, correct gowning and gloving technique must be used. One such technique will now be demonstrated. Keeping a safe distance from the OR furniture and the walls, the scrub nurse is handed the sterile gown by the circulating nurse. It is packed inside out. The gown is unfolded with care taken not to shake it too much, as this may result in dust particles rising and causing contamination. The circulating nurse ties the back of the gown. Take note of how the scrub nurse keeps the hands within the arms of the gown. With the gown tied at the neck and the back, the scrub nurse is now ready to glove. Having been opened onto a sterile surface, the inside pack of the gloves is opened, as shown, with the hands kept inside the gown. Only the edges are handled, and the bottom is folded to prevent the pack from folding back. Take note of the right hand glove. The left hand is used to pick up this glove and flip it onto the right hand, with the thumb of the glove facing down. The left hand then manoeuvres the glove over the right hand, and once the thumb is in position, the other fingers fit easily into the glove. The now gloved right hand is used to grasp the left hand glove via the cuff, and again the hand is manoeuvred into the glove. With a bit of coaxing, the thumb is located into the right place. The other fingers soon follow suit. With now gloved hands, closure of the sterile gown can now be performed. The scrub nurse hands the unsterile tie handle to the circulating nurse, spins around and grabs only the sterile part of the tie and completes closure of the gown, again using a bow. The hands are held up to prevent contamination. Only gloved hands and this part of the sterile gown are considered safe to come in contact with a sterile field.